Good afternoon, and uh, for those celebrating, a, a very happy and prosperous uh, Diwali to you all. Um, and huge thanks again to Observer Research Foundation, who's a great partner of the organization that I lead, Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Um, thanks for inviting me today. And sorry I can't uh, join you in person, but I'll be in Dubai, of course, uh, very soon and hope to see many of you there. Um, so I've just been given a few minutes to make some remarks. And um, I think everyone would agree that right now the world feels uh, dangerous and complicated and divided. Um, all of the challenges that we face are profound and climate change is arguably the most existential of all of them. I've spent my entire professional life working on climate change, and in particular, trying to bolster the multilateral climate process. Um, and I also spent a lot of time working on the build up to the Paris Agreement as a friend of COP26 and now um, on the advisory committee of Dr. Sultan, who I understand that you heard from um, earlier today. Um, we're at a really crucial point um, in the climate negotiations. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about the reflections from uh, G20 into the COP. Um, but the good news is that climate remains one of the few areas where there are clear avenues for discussion and cooperation, north, south, and east, west. Um, this is evidenced regularly by even continued discussions between the US on China and climate change when, when geopolitical tensions are high. Um, and so it's really important that we use climate as a bridge uh, globally at this time. And the G20 process has really helped doing that. And I really want to commend India's presidency. In fact, the Delhi Declaration was the first G20 text to center the 1.5 degree objective um, and had specific language on, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 43% uh, by 2030, which is really, really crucial as we go into the global stock take. And it also had really good language on clean energy um, and echoed Dr. Sultan's calls for a tripling of renewables capacity um, and, and centered universal energy access, which I think is absolutely crucial. Um, it also called for a doubling of the rate of energy efficiency improvements. And in fact, in the near term, um, that will drive uh, the greatest level of emissions reductions. So the bar was set for COP28. Um, and a real emphasis on just transition from the G20 uh, also sets uh, sets the tone. I was also, and I heard um, some people mention this on the previous panel, I was listening in, um, the fact that the African Union has formally been brought into the process, I think is really exciting. It's a major success for voice and representation when so many multilateral institutions really don't have uh, what anyone would describe as modern or effective governance. Um, and this is particularly exciting given going into COP28 because um, you will have seen the work that Kenya and the African Union did at the Africa Climate Summit in September, setting out a really bold agenda, uh, positioning Africa not just as a victim of climate change, but really as a continent that has a huge amount to add um, and um, to the negotiations, but also to offer in terms of practical solutions. So it's really crucial that the African Union is at the table and both India and the UAE have been uh, really instrumental in raising uh, African voices, including um, um, broader Global South voices. Um, so I know UAE is going to pick up quite a lot of the Indian agenda. Um, and this this uh, story of livelihoods and inclusivity and equity um, is a core part of, of that um, baton handing, to use, a, to use a relay race kind of term. Um, so I, I want to talk about a couple of issues um, that I think particularly uh, draw um, links between the G20 and COP28 and, and finance. I'm sure you heard Dr. Sultan say a lot about this uh, this morning. Um, I think finance um, is going to be one of the bellwethers of the COP. I think an outcome on oil and gas is going to be another key bellwether of the COP. Everyone is looking to the UAE to make progress in these areas that hitherto has seemed so, so challenging. Um, I've been spending a lot of my time over the last year or so on finance in particular. Um, we know that the capital exists, we hear it again and again, but it's not necessarily accessible for the people that need it. Um, we are going to have to have a conversation about subsidies and taxes, uh, but a key issue that I've been working on this year is around the cost of capital. Um, India's G20 presidency also needs to be commended here because 
Um, the leader's declaration set out very clear expectations on the scale of finance that was required. But interestingly, the G20 under uh, India's presidency also commissioned a really important report on MDBs, uh, which made very clear recommendations about the approach to risk, um, how to use balance sheets, how to be more efficient, um, and essentially how to improve MDBs, but not just to make them better, which I think is an agenda shared by all, but to also make them bigger, which means that these institutions, on the assumption that they can reform, could um, um, increase in size to deliver on the scale of finance that's needed. Um, and I just want to come back again to this issue of cost of capital. While renewables are now cheaper across the world, the cost of capital in many parts of the world is prohibitive. Um, and that makes it very, very difficult for those who need it to access it. And this comes against the background of a debt crisis. And the current debt crisis is not the result of uh, macroeconomic mismanagement. It is the result of exogenous shocks. So COVID, war, climate shocks, all of those things um, have conspired to create unsustainable um, uh, debt situations for many countries. It's not the quantum of debt that is unsustainable. It's the structure of that debt that is unsustainable. Uh, foreign currency, very heavy in foreign currency um, and very high cost of capital. Um, so we need to address these issues structurally. The COP can build on the work of the G20 um, and the work on MDB reform. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Sultan spoke to you this morning about the unmet commitments on 100 billion and about the need to capitalize the loss and damage fund. Um, and I think at the World Leaders Summit, um, at the start of COP, we really need to see heads of state and finance ministers and the MDB and IFI presidents and private sector CEOs come out in force explaining what they're doing to meet these challenges around um, not just the scale of finance, but also the quality of, of, of finance, as I said, and the cost of finance. Um, and they need to talk about how they're meeting existing commitments and how they're going further. I'm going to be moderating a discussion with MDB and IFI presidents about this system-wide reform agenda. And we nearly really, we really urgently need to hear about the level of ambition. The tricky thing for Dr. Sultan is, of course, that the COP doesn't have control of many of the institutions uh, that are needed to drive the transition. Um, so Dr. Sultan is going to have to use his convening power as COP president to get um, all of these institutions um, and finance ministers and heads of state to commit to a a framework that can take us forward. Um, and that's going to be a really, really important piece of work. And all of this is going to build on a lot of the work that's been initiated by leaders from the Global South. I'm sure many of you have heard of the efforts of the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, and her Bridgetown agenda, uh, which has been really, really crucial in challenging the MDBs and the international uh, financial system. Uh, that was picked up by President Ruto um, in the Africa Climate Summit, as I mentioned, also, the V20 finance ministers from the most climate vulnerable countries with the Accra Marrakesh agenda. Um, all of these initiatives have come from the Global South. Um, fortunately, they've been picked up by some leaders um, like President Macron, and he held his Paris summit uh, in May. But we need many more examples of um, commitment from uh, G7 um, and other donors. And, and the debt crisis can't be forgotten as the backdrop because if the MDBs just provide more debt in the current context, that's not going to solve the problem. We need a range of financial solutions that really address the needs of, of borrowers, not just uh, the needs of creditors. So as I said, I just wanted to commend India's G20 presidency um, and for the work it's done. Um, and I'm really excited to be attending COP. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be a transformative moment on, on finance, but also on oil and gas. We've seen huge profits sitting on the balance sheets of oil companies. Um, only 5% uh, of those profits are currently being directed towards clean energy. Um, those companies need to step up, step up. But as I said, we're going to need fiscal instruments and regulation uh, to tackle methane and many of the other issues on the oil and gas agenda. Um, so, of course, uh, India's G20 and COP presidency uh, under UAE are parts of a much bigger process. We're not going to solve everything this year. Um, I'm particularly looking forward also to the work of Brazil with its uh, G20 next year. And it's also going to host COP um, in 2025. And then it will be the turn of South Africa. 
Um, so there's a real opportunity to continue the legacy of the Indian G20 with a focus on livelihoods and equity um, and ambition. Um, and I'm hoping very much uh, that all of you will be joining us in Dubai um, to land some of these really, really crucial issues. Um, happy Diwali and thank you very much.